I have to support. Be in the conference room or whether you would rather have a field trip or something like that as a way to party and, you know, explore something new. Another chapter had been doing it that way and it seemed like they were having fun. So I thought, hey, you know, let's see what people want. So I'll go with whatever. Okay, any questions? We have a new addition to our group. I'd like to introduce Mason Wolf. He's been trying to get with us for a month or so. Your, your name has been on the list, and it's good to actually meet you in person. But when you get a chance, go by and say hi to him. Let him know this. We don't bother. Enjoy having lots of new people come in. We don't bother. Depends on the class. So, okay. Today we have Mike Mullenwig, who's going to be uh, talking to us about wetlands and barrier island ecology. This is really something that, if you've been in the area for very long, you'll learn islands move. Um, total booth in the middle of that used to be in the middle of the bridge is now way over on the Galveston Island. <laughs> Because the island kept moving this way and Pollock's Island kept moving the other way, or just getting smaller, it may be. <laughs> but if you had the time, you know, 40 years, you could see a lot of change in an area. And that's one that I definitely uh, realized gee, you know, beachfront property may not be a really good buy <laughs> all the time. But uh, Mike has been the interpretive ranger for the park. He's now uh, managing the San Luis Pass Park. And he will be working, and Nate will be working with him on our field trip. So when we're learning about all that, we will need a couple of people who are willing to get wet to do some saning, if you're willing. Robin. <laughs> she didn't say no. Uh, you were obviously available if you would like to. If any of the ladies would like to do it, you know. Nate will definitely need at least one person that will get in the water with him to do some saying. Is it cold? Yeah, it wasn't the weather. Uh, it's supposed to be. It's 75. Sarah and Alejandro are volunteer for saining. Oh, okay. Because you're off the hook now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, that does start getting confusing. Like, I'm gay, but. <laughs> yeah, we might be flying you like <laughs> you're an ocean. Yeah, that's what let you all take the good pictures. All right. So I think we've got most everybody here. Mike, are you ready to? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to get out of the way and hush. And I'd like to talk a little bit after the meeting, if we have time, about the projects. Sure. I wonder if I have a opinion. Anybody should have. Okay, I think the county has a saying, don't you? Yeah, we've got a, a 12 foot and a 25 foot. Uh, how big is yours? Oh, okay, now nah, I think we got it covered. We've got, we used to have a big 40 foot bag net, which was extremely hard to pull, but a lot of fun because you caught a lot of stuff in it. Uh, but you almost needed a truck to pull that thing. And 40 feet is a lot of water to be pulling a net through it. Um, uh, well, good evening, everybody. I am Mike Mullenweg. I am the park superintendent at San Luis Pass County Park, like Melanie said, but I used to be the park interpreter and program coordinator for Brazoria County Park. I was also the park interpreter at Mustang Island 
State Park and Goose Island State Park. So I've been working on barrier islands for the better part of about 15 years now as the park interpreter. And so when Master Naturalist first asked me to do a program on wetlands, if you look at your syllabus, uh, today's program is, is on wetlands. Um, I kind of morphed it into a program on barrier island ecology. Barrier island ecology is very closely related to estuaries and wetlands. So I've got a couple of little parts to my program. One of them is just so we can technically go through it. And you can say you've been at it is wetlands. So some things that we want to answer are what is a wetland, types of wetlands, uh, wetlands that we have in Texas, and then the really the main law that governs uh, wetlands. Can everybody hear me okay? I've got a pretty loud voice, so no microphone today. Um, I've also got a bum hip, so I'll be sitting down throughout this program. Uh, if you got any questions, just raise your hand and I'll uh, I'll be happy to answer them. But first, what is a wetland? A wetland is a distinct ecosystem that is flooded by water either permanently or seasonally, where oxygen-free processes prevail. The primary factor that is distinguishes a wetland from other landforms of water bodies is the characteristic vegetation of aquatic plants that have adapted to the unique hydric soil. So a lot of words. <clears throat> what is a wetland? So it's a body of land that's covered with water. That's pretty simple, right? It's a wet land. Uh, now, it's not covered by water all the time. That would be a lake or a pond. It's covered uh, almost permanently or even very sparsely, very rarely by water, but it's covered by water enough that the soil changes. So the soil goes from regular aerated uh, soil that plants have an easy time growing in into that hydric soil, that soil without oxygen in it that the plants have adapted to live in. Uh, and so that's how you can tell a wet. You can tell a wetland by the plants that are growing in it. What are growing in it? Wetland plants. Uh, more on that here in a little bit. But uh, so you have different types of plants growing in this different types of soil. So basically what makes a wetland is the soil. It's covered by water enough that the soil has changed. And you can tell that by the plants that are growing in it. Don't oh, tell me it's not working now. Okay, so uh, types of wetlands is uh, just kind of mire, marsh, swamp, flooded grassland, riparian wetlands. Uh, mires, you have a bog or a fin, and you'll have to, we we have one in Texas. Uh, a bog, and you'll have to forgive me because I forget the difference between a bog and a fin, but a uh, a mire is basically standing water that sits. Uh, a, there's a bog and a fin. One of them has a source of water that flows down into it, like from a creek or a stream or some runoff uh, from a river, but it has a, a water source that's identifiable. And then the other one is just from rain that settles down. Forgive me, I forget which one is which. That's your homework for tonight. Google the difference between a, a fin and a bog. Uh, we actually do have a mire in Texas, kind of in central east Texas. There is one. Marsh, we have two types of marsh, a freshwater marsh and a saltwater marsh. And those are differentiated just like you think they would. 
a uh, freshwater marsh is a marsh with fresh water. A saltwater marsh is a marsh with salt water, like down by the coast, by the ocean. Um, a marsh and a swamp. Anybody know the difference between a marsh and a swamp? Two different types of wetlands. A marsh is a wetland predominantly covered by grasses or non-woody vegetation. A uh, a uh, swamp, sorry. A swamp is a wetland predominantly covered by woody vegetation. So up in Northeast Texas, over in Louisiana, where you have big trees growing up out of the water, big cypress trees, willow trees, uh, that's a swamp. Down south around Corpus, where you have mangrove trees, that's, uh, again, you have freshwater and saltwater swamps. A saltwater, example of a saltwater swamp would be a mangrove forest where you have those mangroves growing up. Any everybody ever been down to Port Aransas and they have the lighthouse lakes out there, which is just a bunch of mangroves growing in the bay, which is brackish to salty water. And so again, you have your marsh, wetland covered with grasses, swamp, wetland covered with trees, and you can have those in fresh or salt water, either one. Uh, flooded grasslands. These are like the Playa Lakes up in the uh, panhandle of Texas and up in the Great Plains. You have these depressions, these low-lying areas out there that after the winter and you have the snow melt, they fill with water and they're real ephemeral. They don't last very long, maybe a month, maybe two months. Um, and then they evaporate for the rest of the year. So they're maybe covered in water for like two months. But again, they're covered in water long enough that that soil changes and there's a different type of vegetation, primarily a different type of grass that grows in those playa lakes. Is it different than a marsh because it's ephemeral? Uh, well, no, it would be considered a marsh because it's a wetland with grassy areas in it. Uh, but it's just, it's a different type that they call a, a particular type, flooded, yeah, yeah flooded, glass, flooded grassland. Generally, a marsh is going to have a permanent set of water around it. Um, that's not 100% true either. Um, marshes dry up, so... Uh, but yeah, it is a little more, yes, general, temporary. Um, uh, and then a riparian wetland, everybody, riparian, what does that mean? Yeah, next to a river, basically. So we're talking about river bottoms, it rains a whole lot, the river rises, floods, floods its banks, and the river bottom is covered with uh, water. And again, it's covered with water long enough that those trees or plants or shrubs that grow on that floodplain are different than the plants that grow just above it. So you got different soil, you got different plants. And that's how you can tell where a floodplain is because it's got different plants growing out of it. Uh, as opposed to right next to it, you have different plants. Saturday, when we go on our uh, field trip, we're going to look at a marsh up to a prairie. And there is a knife edge separation between these plants that grow down in the marsh and these plants that grow up on the uh, prairie. In fact, there's even a high, low, a high marsh and a low marsh. I'll get into all that later. But the plants change just like that because of the amount of water that the amount of time that water is covering that land. It changes the soil to a greater or lesser degree. 
Did I confuse anybody on all this already? Uh, so those are the types of wetlands in Texas. I think it went over all this. Yeah. Freshwater wetlands are wherever shallow water collects on the land. Uh, river floodplains, bottomland, hardwoods, marshes, seeps, springs, ponds, playa lakes down in the valley, sloughs, oxbows, and swamps along some of the stream banks and lake areas uh, and places where the water table reaches the surface. That's kind of the mire we were talking about. Uh, and again, freshwater wetlands contain plant species adapted to life where water levels may go up and down. Uh, yeah, many of these species can withstand periods when the wetlands may become dry. So that's kind of talking about those Playa Lakes for 11. It's a wetland plant, but for 11 months out of the year, it's dry as a bone. And if anybody's ever driven through the Panhandle in the summertime, you know there's no lakes out there anymore. Uh, it is flat and dry, but those wetland plants have actually adapted to live out there. They're actually pretty cool because when you get out there in the summertime on those playa lakes, you can actually see the grass is all the same level, but you can tell where the lakes are because it's different grass that grows down in those little playa lakes as opposed to up on the plain. Uh, so you can actually see, we're going to see that dramatically on Saturday. Okay. I don't even remember what this says. So I haven't done this since last year. Uh, so coastal wetlands. Oh, so these are the types of wetlands. Yeah, freshwater wetlands, coastal wetlands, form where saltwater and freshwater mix together. Uh, these are our coastal shorelines. Anybody know? Where salt water and fresh water meet together, what do we call that? Anybody know? Well, both, yeah, brackish water and an estuary. So very good. Uh, these are the coastal shorelines, shallow bays and inlets and swamps, marshes, mudflats, and deltas of our coastal lowlands and estuaries. Plant species must be able to survive changes in both salinity and water level because of these wetlands are often affected by changes in the amount of freshwater inflow and tidal fluctuations in water levels. So we're getting into barrier island ecology with this one. This is, and it's what I really like uh, is the barrier islands. Uh, what Melanie was talking about was how, how fast they change. A barrier island, you see geology in months as opposed to the Grand Canyon where it takes hundreds of thousands or millions of years to see the change that that river is affecting on that uh, canyon on a barrier island. And four or five months, you can see massive changes on a barrier island because it's made of loose sand. So anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the uh, plant species, like it says, these have to adapt to not only rising and falling water levels, uh, you have uh, tides come in and can flood whole areas. You can have tide come in and reach all the way up to the dunes. Everybody's seen that where the just a, a super high tide, a, a spring tide will come in, touches the dunes, floods some of the houses in Surfside, covers nearly that entire barrier island with the exception of uh, maybe the highway and a few houses that are on real high property. Some of those plants are getting covered. Not only are they getting covered with water, they're getting covered with salt water. Uh, and then you have instances such as Harvey where so much fresh water flows down the rivers and bayous and creeks and streams and floods into the bays that the bays can turn into fresh water. And so you can go from fresh water to a drought in the summer where these bays can get saltier because of evaporation 
The tides come in, they bring salt with it. The water evaporates, it leaves the salt in the bays. The bays can get saltier than the Gulf of Mexico. And these plants have to survive that. Uh, so not only are they flooded sometimes, more or less, uh, but they also go through sometimes rapid and significant changes in salinity, uh, which is, I don't, you know, most plants, if you throw salt on them, you're going to kill that plant. These uh, coastal estuary, coastal wetland plants have adapted to live in that fluctuating salt. Halophytes. What's that? Halophytes. That's what those plants are called. Oh, living with fresh and salt? That I didn't know, so that's why I have to write that one down. Uh, wetlands of Texas. So on the high plains, you have your Playa Lake wetlands uh, found on the Texas high plains. Uh, formed in shallow depressions in the land surface. They're usually round and small and about 15 to 20 acres in size. They fill with uh, water from rain or snow and they form wetlands and are only about a foot deep. There are about uh, 20,000 of these in Texas. And they play a major role in recharge, recharge of the Ogallala Aquifer. Uh, ply lakes go through frequent wet and dry cycles. Riparian wetlands are also found on the high plains alongside the rivers. These are the wetlands that form among the edges of the streams and rivers. I just said that. Uh, they're important for food and cover for wildlife. So again, you have up on the high plains, what kind of makes up the high plains is there's nothing but grass. Uh, and so it's flat, it's grassy. That's what they call them the stake plains is because when the Spanish explorers came over, they had to uh, raise piles of rocks so they were landmarks because there were just no landmarks for them to see out there. So the story goes. Uh, but very flat, very indistinctive, where then you have a river cutting through it and along that river, along that riparian area, that wetland, you have uh, mesquite trees growing, you have willow trees growing, you have cottonwood trees growing. Uh, and so out on the prairie, it's good for a couple of types of animals. Buffalo love it. Uh, back when we had buffalo roam in the plains. But a lot of animals need cover, they need shelter. And so these riparian areas would be that cover, that shelter, because there was literally no place else out there on the Texas plains. Central Texas are spring-fed wetlands, and they're an amazing geological feature of Central Texas. These are wetlands that are filled by water and may have traveled great distances underground in an aquifer before flowing to the surface. Uh, springs occur where there are faults, cracks, and other openings in the aquifer. Riparian wetlands are also found in central Texas along the riverside. So a lot of uh, central Texas has is famous for its spring and its spring-fed rivers. Uh, water that has fallen to the ground is rain. It seeps through, again, all the cracks and fissures in the rock out there and goes down into the aquifer. And then eventually we'll get will spring up out of the aquifer and uh, again spread out on the land there and start again spring out enough that it starts causing different plants to grow along that area. Uh, South Texas is fun. Two main types. Sand sheet wetlands are small isolated depressions found in places where wind erodes away topsoil exposing clay soils underneath these depressions trap and hold water when it rains. Sounds a lot like a Playa Lake, doesn't it? Uh, the difference is this one has a clay-based bottom. Uh, and Rosacas, 
Resaca is basically an oxbow lake. Everybody know what an oxbow lake is? When a river twists uh, and where it, it twists so much that these two areas meet and this gets cut off. This oxbow lake gets cut off. Down on the Rio Grande Valley, they call that a resaca. And resacas are channels of the Rio Grande that have been cut off from the river. Just said that. Uh, they fill with water and sediment, creating shallow wetlands and ponds. Uh, they may be the only places wildlife can find fresh water in this very arid part of Texas. Uh, and again, both kinds become dry during a drought and then fill back up with water. So with the exception of the Rio Grande, that, the Rio Grande River running through there, these sand sheet wetlands and these resacas are, you know, some of the main forms of water, main sources of water for wildlife down there in the valley. Trans-Pecos, forgot about this, uh, Trans-Pecos region, spring-fed wetlands found on the side of mountains and in small mountain valleys are called mountain springs, uh, very similar to the hill country, it's just further out in the Chisos and Guadalupe Mountains. Uh, Senegas and other types of spring-fed wetlands, these are small isolated springs that occur on the desert floor in West Texas. Senegas and mountain springs provide waters for plants and animals that could not otherwise survive in the desert. Probably one of the more famous uh, Senegas out there is San Solomon Springs uh, by the little town of Tahoyaville, which is Balmoray State Park. If anybody's ever been out there to Balmoray, that's a spring fed uh, spring. It's a spring. Uh, that pumps up out of the ground right there. Yeah, quite an incredible lick. A lot of water comes out of that spring. And uh, naturally, it would cause, again, different plants to be growing around that spring. However, every bit of that spring has been irrigated or used for irrigation. So basically, you're growing squash and cabbage and all types of vegetables down there in Tahoyaville uh, coming out from San Solomon Springs. East Texas, uh, bottomland hardwoods are the dominant wetlands in East Texas. Uh, these are known for the large trees that live in the water. They're also called forested wetlands. Unlike most of Texas, East Texas receives large amounts of rainfall. Uh, this rain floods streams and rivers, spilling water out onto the floodplain. The force of this flooding often reshapes the stream bottoms of floodplains. Y'all can kind of read this. Uh, the neat thing about East Texas is, again, it says uh, East Texas receives quite a bit of rain. The rest of Texas is kind of a desert. Uh, the way I was taught was uh, when I was taking a geology class, Texas is five areas of North America squeezed together. You have the eastern edge of the southeast pine forest in East Texas. You have the northern edge of the Sonoran Desert down in the valley and in South Texas. You have the far eastern edge, oh, sorry, you have the western edge of the uh, pine forest. You have the eastern edge of the Rocky Mountains. And then you have the southern edge of the Great Plains. Those are kind of the edges around Texas. And then in the middle, you have the hill country, kind of all squashed together there. And so, East Texas is the, really the only one of those areas that gets significant rainfall. Uh, 
you know, over 20 inches a year. And so don't quote me on that, but around 20 inches a year uh, is what a lot of the other areas in the state get or less. And so uh, East Texas, pretty much divided by I-35, if you look at a uh, rainfall map of Texas, there's a line dividing East and West Texas, and it pretty much uh, follows uh, I-35, sorry, I-35 uh, down the center of the state. That also happens to be the shoreline of a prehistoric ocean. Uh, back when we had dinosaurs in Texas, that was the shoreline. So a lot of natural barriers right there in between I-35 uh, are going along I-35. So East Texas, we have big tall trees growing in hardwood bottomlands where the river floods and uh, that is the main type of wetland. They also, of course, do have freshwater swamps in East Texas, uh, especially up around Caddo Lake, uh, have some very famous freshwater swamps uh, down around uh, uh, Toledo Bend Reservoir. There's also some uh, fairly famous Texas swamps, sorry. And, uh, That's about it on East Texas. And then the Gulf Coast. And this is where I get into it. Uh, so coastal wetlands are formed with salt water and freshwater mix. Did I just go backwards? Nope. Uh, salinities vary widely as freshwater's inflow in the coastal area goes up and down uh, through rain events. You have a lot of rain and you get a lot of freshwater flowing into the bay. You get a drought, you get very little fresh water flowing into the bay. Uh, there may be times that it is entirely fresh or times salinity can be greater than the ocean water. Uh, these wetlands can form in depressions in the land near the coasts, bays, and estuaries. Rains fill these depressions and sometimes storm pushes salt water into them. Coastal wetlands can also form in low-lying areas of land where rivers flow into estuaries and bays. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Many coastal wetlands have water levels and salinities that fluctuate daily because they are subject to tides. These are our estuaries and river mouths. Uh, these are called tidal wetlands and are the tidal flats, bays, marshes, and bayous that we see throughout the Texas coast. So again, your coastal wetlands uh, primarily are the marshes, well, primarily it's the marshes around the Texas bays. Uh, you do have, again, down south, some swamps uh, along the Texas bays. And you do have, like they were talking about, some of those low-lying areas that get filled with rainwater and can uh, get flooded by tides. We'll see some areas of that when we head out for our field trip on Saturday. So, uh, trying to think of what else on coastal wetlands. They're, uh, again, a very dynamic wetland and a very dynamic part of the state. Uh, where things change just constantly and rapid. And then, so wetland regulations, this just kind of goes over the uh, main act, which is section 404 of the Clean Water Act, is the main act that regulates wetlands in the United States. Uh, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Army Corps of Engineers used the 1987 Corps of Engineers Wetland Delineation Manual and Regional Supplements to, to define wetlands for the Clean Water Act Section 404 permit program. 
So that's just kind of to let you know what federal laws, and there are federal laws protecting all the wetlands in the United States. That's not, excuse me. Okay, so any questions on wetlands, kind of what a wetland is, what? Marshes and swamps. What what is it that determines the area, whether that area becomes a marsh or swamp? Soil or is it availability? Well, yes. Uh, the the soil will ultimately determine what plant grows there. A little bit of it is the availability of the plants. The Playa Lakes, there's just no trees growing out there. Uh, when you have a swamp, uh, so generally what you have the most of is going to tend to propagate itself. If you have a bunch of tall trees, grass is not going to grow underneath them in the shade. Uh, if you have a playa lake up on the plains, generally the high winds or what used to be wildfires would keep our you know, 8 million stampeding buffalo would keep trees to a minimum. Uh, so, it, and the and the soil will determine whether a tree can grow in it or a grass can grow in it uh, to a certain extent. You know, how much oxygen is in the soil, how much nitrogen is in the soil, uh, and all that can be affected by how much water or how long it is submerged underwater and where. Kind of a rambling question. Sorry about that. Uh, rambling answer. Sorry about that. Uh, Cypress swamp, as opposed to a marsh with grasses. I don't really know the exact reason for that. That's a good question. Uh, it grows among or the. Uh, big thickest, big thicket cypress swamp uh, grows amongst other evergreen trees that are already all around there. Um, and again, you tend to have. If you look at what's north of those areas, don't you think like what you're saying, it kind of tells you whether it'll be a marsh or a swamp? Like in the piney forest, you get. A swamp, and in the grasslands, you get marsh. Kind of. Yeah, that kind of what I was saying about what you what you have there will dictate what kind of wetland you get. A grassy area is going to turn into a marsh and have more grassy areas in it more often than not. And a wooded area is going to turn into a swamp and have more wooded areas, more woody vegetation growing in it. Uh, But I'll say, what causes one to dominate the other? That I don't know the answer to. Uh, that's a good question. I've I've never thought of that to look it up. But that's I'm probably going to do that tomorrow. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, but there's forests all the way from kind of East Texas right on to the East Coast and. Swamps and mangroves would be predominant on that part of the Gulf Coast. Only when you get over to here, where it's a, I mean, this is a grassland, even though we have a lot of trees here now. Yeah. Um, then you see that this would all be marshland because of the grassland. I mean, that, I don't know the exact answer, but just looking at a map in my head, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know the answer. It could be rainfall amounts. Um, because of what she was talking about was basically all of Southeast United States has greater, you know, where it's forested has a greater amount of rainfall than say the Great Plains or certainly the Southwest, uh, where it's, uh, less rainfall and less woody vegetation. But I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question. I'm going to have to look that up. Mike, I, I might help you just a minute here while you collect your thoughts. 
But as naturalists, we're going to be talking to people, children, kids, adults, everywhere, and even the Corps of Engineers, if you're involved in obtaining permits or such from the Corps, as Mike pointed out, Section 404 permitting process, you have to go through identifying whether you have wetlands on your property or not. You can't build on wetlands, okay? And if you have parts of your property or an easement you're obtaining, say you're a city or a county or whatever, uh, you're wanting to build something through a wetland. Uh, let's just say you wanted to dig a ditch, okay? Or you wanted to put a garage. Well, you have to appropriate wetlands to take care of, I'm sorry, you have to create wetlands for the wetlands you destroy or you're using. And that's the way, that's the permitting process. And that permitting process is usually about five to one. So if you're talking, you want to improve on a one acre wetland, you got to provide as much as five. And then sometimes if it's what they call a pristine wetland, you may be a set more. And I guess what I wanted to say, we're all into being naturalists. We're protecting the wildlife out there, the birds, the plants, the whatever. There are wetland plants that aren't any good at all. They, you know, when you talk to the court, I mean, you go out there and think, oh, a tallow tree is growing in wetlands, you know, and it is a horrible tree. It destroys the soil there. But when you get into identifying what wetland plants you have on your particular property or easement or such, um, there are, let's just say, chemical uh, combinations that you look at the roots. <laughs> this is how complicated it is. You check out, pull those plants up, look at the roots, and the ones that we want, or the core wants, or all of us want to help the soil, there are chemical oxygen and nitrogen processes that are positive for the soil. And there are other plants that are not positive for the soil. So all of us just need to take that and expand on it and learn from our process here. Sorry, Mike. I no, that's good. Just wanted to throw that one out. Yeah, what he was talking about, wetland mitigation, That the county comes into that all the time when we want to do something like, let's say we want to build a new boat ramp. Well, you got to cut that into an area, let's say that area is wetlands. And so the county would be assessed the mitigation of, you know, let's say we take up two acres of wetlands. And so we would be assessed of having to provide, let's say, you know, five to one, 10 acres of wetlands. And that could be just through a, you know, a, a fee that we pay so that uh, you Corps of Engineers can go out and buy wetlands. Uh, and so they buy uplands to make wetlands. Yes. They yeah. All, all the they don't need to buy wetlands. They well, true. take care of anything that is said to be a wetland. They uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of uplands in the United States used to be wetlands. And we have drained them or raised them or uh, <laughs> altered them so that they are, for lack of a, a better term, I'm going to say the word usable. Uh, the one thing about wetlands, especially in early uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century United States, was a wetland was basically considered useless. Can't grow crops on it, can't raise cattle on it, can't build a house on it because it's going to flood and you're going to uh, have your house flooded. So it was basically considered useless land. And so they did a lot to get rid of wetlands in the United States. They still do. 
you can, again, you can't build a house on a wetland, and there's a lot of nice land down here on the coast that if you raise it up and it doesn't flood all the time, uh, you can sell it and put houses on it and make a lot of money. And that's so, so what's that? That's somewhere else, though. Yes. Well, that's exactly right. It will, and it will probably eventually flood there. Uh, depending on how high you raise or how high you raise it, it's probably still going to flood there. But not until quite recently, the 1960s and 70s, did we start looking at wetlands as not useless pieces of property. And so we're we're <clears throat> kind of behind the eight ball on preserving wetlands because we got rid of so many of them for so long uh, that now through wetland mitigation, we're trying to turn, uh, like Mel was saying, uplands back into wetlands. Uh, I, there's a, a PBS special talking about the uh, billions of dollars that are being spent to flood the Everglades because of the millions of dollars they spent to drain the Everglades. So uh, it's just kind of a funny little thing. We're always trying to correct our mistakes of the past. Yes. I, I feel like I just read that somewhere that that's kind of how they got rid of malaria because they drained wetlands in general. That was a big part of it. And then DDT. And yeah, the DDT. <laughs> Uh, but the uh, I yeah again I don't know the answer to that I, I would imagine that's probably so once they found out that malaria came from mosquitoes and mosquitoes grew in stagnant water uh, I'm sure they did use that as a a reason to drain wetlands. Water that's very, very badly polluted and such. Water that a lot of your other aquatic insects cannot live in. So, yeah, you have to work hard to get rid of them. Yes. Yeah, we haven't successfully done it down here on the coast. <laughs> Take some somewhere else? Do they typically do it in the same area or can it be in another part of the state? Or like, does it need to be right there? No, you're generally what happens is you're not on on that, you're not physically creating wetlands. The government, the, the Corps of Engineer will do that. They'll do that with your money that you paid. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They, they'll determine where it's most needed and most efficient to do it at but no it could be in Oregon uh because they're they're taking care of the you know it's it's they're taking care of the entire United States wetlands uh, so I'm sure in whatever contract you're signing to build that parking lot out there on the wetlands it's you know it it may I've, I've I've never seen one where it's been specifically pointed out that these monies will stay in the Texas. I'm sure it could, but my knowledge it just goes into a big general fund. Do you have any experience on that? Well, not a ton. I'm more of an air permitting um, okay. person, but. You know, it's a, these are all very, like, we're really simplifying what we're talking about right here. Yeah. Um, there's a whole process when you do something like this. You have to do an environmental impact assessment, and you may not get to do what you want to do. I mean, we're set, acting like we're just going to be able to do that every yeah. time. You may not get a permit to do that. Um, and you may, and then, yeah, and, and part of your permit may be that you will contribute money or you will go, you know, do some kind of offsetting activity um, if you get the permit to do it in the first place. I, it's it's really complicated and, and, you know, more wetlands used to be protected 
by far, um, in 2023, you know, we changed the definition of a wetland. The, the Congress did, and, and they made uh, the definition much more narrow. So there's a lot less land that is protected, um, which is heartbreaking to me because wetlands are pretty much the most impactful, productive ecosystem that we have. So um, anyways, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look up more of that because, you know, there's companies that that's their job. So I'm sure that the, the they, you know, they're old companies. I looked at working for one, um, but they do that for like companies. And I know one of my clients um, over in, uh, they're not on the ship channel, they're on the thing next to the ship channel. Anyways, they had to do a big project like this. They had to do like acres and acres and acres and acres. But I don't know how they picked it or who they got to do it, but they actually did it themselves. So anyways, it's a pretty complicated topic. Yeah. I did not know. So you uh, Congress changed the definition of a wetland in 2023? Yes. I had not heard that. Yes. I've got to go look that up. It, it's a, so it's the the definition of a wetland used to be basically pretty broad, right? If it's, you know, got water on got the wetland. or connected to, it's all about the connection, keeping the connection. And now it's, I can't remember exactly the change, but it did dramatically decrease, um, decrease that. And I, you know, I can't give you numbers and I'm not going to lie to you. I was um, but now I'm going to go reread it so I can yeah, tell you guys about I, it. I need to read that because I had not heard that. Yeah, I, environmental law and, and environmental, a lot of it is law, but it can get, it's really governed by different politics. Yeah, who's in Congress, who's the president, and they're going to make a lot of changes. <laughs> Most drastic one I like you could talk about would be mountaintop removal in West Virginia. So... You can like remove like it's crazy. Chop it off. Just you want to go get coal? Just blow up. Just blow up the whole mountaintop, right? Yeah. Like a third of it. Just blow it up, and then where are you going to put it? Just go dump it in the valley. That's not going to cause flooding issues. Okay. <laughs> one political party will be like, "Yeah, that's fine," and you know, another one's going to be like, "Yeah, I don't know about those guys." So I mean, that's. But you would think that those would be laws yeah. that people would agree on, and they're not. They're a lot of times done by. Um, governmental agencies upon the whims of who's in charge. So, anyways, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say what I believe in any way. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. You can look at but yeah, it's just definitely me. something I want to read up. Changes with the tides of who's in charge. It's like a very right. <laughs> so. Real quick, what is a barrier island? This is the definition I love. Because uh, barrier islands are coastal landforms and a type of dune system that are exceptionally flat or lumpy areas of sand that are formed by wave and tidal action parallel to the mainland coast. I love a definition of something that says, yeah, it's very, very flat or very, very lumpy. Like you need to just say it's a piece of land. Uh, but they form parallel to the coast uh or par parallel to the mainland down here on the coast so we've got barrier islands in texas we're going to go over we're going to go over the uh there, there's a set format to how you uh a barrier island is laid out uh, all barrier islands are laid out the same way and we're going to go over that format and we're going to uh go over the barrier islands in Texas and then go over the separate parts of them that we're going to explore on our field trip. But before we do that, uh, do we need to take a break? We want to take a break? Sure. Okay. Sure. Well, let's, let's take a break. I could definitely... Walk around the corner. I can't oh, get it. Sorry, I thought you had it. Okay. Yeah. Twenty twenty three definition of wetland placement getting out. Yeah. 
Cancel your plans. <laughs> oh, I know. This happened last week. Too. Yeah. I was free well, uh, for all of the time, and then life happened. That's most people, all those dog yeah. owners, you know. Well, we kind of went through some. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. So they, yeah, we were trying to. So this is one where they're all. Yeah, tribe. Yeah. You don't want to take it. Yeah. Yeah. So make sure you block it. Okay. Yeah. To say the pronouns are also. I snack. Let me make some coffee real quick. That, that's what this is all about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, the coffees are good. And I think the man seems to be good. Okay, that works. Let me get us out of here. Uh, I know where it is. Yeah, I've never. I've never passed it. Yeah, they want to bring up. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Actually, they want kind of yeah. 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 and whatever it is. Yeah. 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 Without knowing for sure, yeah. I would say I would doubt it. Usually when you get a little of now there's you know not to say they didn't go through the process of getting a permit in time. Well I, I get surprised at a lot of things I see. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would, I don't want to say they're not allowed to do it, but I would be surprised if they're allowed to do it without a permit. So whether they got a permit or not is random on them. But, uh, Texas General Land Auction in Texas. Yeah. They do that for the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, but... Uh, that would be the first call I would make. Texas Court. Texas General Land Arch. Yeah. Under our current. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 
I could probably get everybody's attention. Do it. <laughs> the fire alarm? Yeah. See. Melanie, are we ready to start again? Still very selective in that listening. Everybody good night. All right. Well, let's, let's go ahead and get started again so we can get out of here before too late. Uh, if you think I talk a lot now, you ought to see me on the field trip. So we'll, we'll get through this so that I can talk on the field trip. Uh, so a barrier island, uh, coastal land form a type of dune system that are exceptionally flat or lumpy. Areas of sand that are formed by wave and tidal action parallel to the main coast. So they're made of sand. Uh, barrier islands are basically overgrown sandbars. Anybody ever walked offshore here in uh, Follett's Island or Surfside? You walk in the water, you get a little deeper, and then it gets a little shallower. And then it gets a little deeper, and then it gets a little shallower. It gets a little deeper. Gets a little, those are the sandbars. The barrier island is just an overgrown sandbar. It has stuck its nose above the surface of the water. A little grass seed started growing right there. And that little grass seed attracted more sand. And then you had a snowball effect to where it built itself into a whole island. So as it starts from a sandbar with a little grass seed on it, it eventually grows up into a barrier island. Now, this is kind of a barrier island system. Uh, not every barrier island has all of these components to it, but a lot of them are gonna have, uh, well, they're all gonna have a beach and a high marsh and a low marsh and a bay behind it. So you have the Gulf or your ocean out here and then behind it where you have your creeks and rivers flowing into it, you have your bay. So this area back here is your estuary. That's where your salt water and your fresh water are mixing. And so all Texas bays all barrier island bays are estuaries. It's where freshwater and saltwater meet. You're going to have uh, storm washovers back here on these tidal flats, uh, the real shallow uh, flooded bay areas. You're going to have an inland or some places call it a cut uh, where there's a hole in between two barrier islands. That's where your tide is going to come in and tide is going to go back out again. Uh, you're going to have your tidal flat up here on the mainland. Again, this is areas that's going to get covered by your tide. High tide, underwater. Low tide, dry. 
So those that's kind of your barrier island system. Now, if you look at this cross section right here, A, that's a cross section of a barrier island. Does this have, oh, looky there. Okay, excellent. Uh, so here we have a cross section of a barrier island. All your barrier islands are going to be made in this way. You're going to start with your ocean out here, whether that's Gulf of Mexico, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean. It's going to start with your large body of water out here, your ocean. That first little uh, sandbar raised itself out of the water and got a little piece of grass growing on it. That's what started your dune. Everything in front of that sandbar is your beach. And we're going to go over different parts of the beach, but everything in front of the dune is your beach. Then you have your dune ridge. And if you kind of look right here, this one kind of shows the vegetation line at the top of the dune. Uh, some places that's the case. A lot of places it's at the bottom of the dune right here. But somewhere on this dune line is going to be your vegetation line. Uh, the vegetation won't grow out on the beach because the tide comes in. And as good as that beach vegetation is at growing in a salty environment, it can't grow where ocean water floods the beach. It's too salty. And so this dune vegetation, and we'll go over the dune vegetation, it will grow right down to the high tide mark, basically. Behind the dune, you have your barrier flat, also called your high marsh or your uh, coastal prairie, I've heard it called. You have your salt marsh or your low marsh, and then you have your lagoon or what we here in Texas call the bay. So that's your cross section of a barrier island. Ocean, beach, dune, high marsh, low marsh, bay. And on any barrier island that you go to, you're gonna be able to point those areas out. Uh, again, the barrier flat or what I call the high marsh and the salt marsh or what I call the low marsh. Uh, those are, you can differentiate between them by the plants that are growing in them. Again, they're two different types of wetlands, high marsh and low marsh. They separate them because there's different plants growing in them. Uh, you kind of Did I lose it? No, there it is. You can kind of see here, up here, this is high enough that it's got some trees growing on it. Very few trees growing on a Texas barrier island. Uh, you might have a couple of palm trees growing out there. Uh, naturally, I'm talking about uh, some salt cedars uh, that are still lingering around from the 1800s when they were planted out there as windbreaks for cattle. Uh, I've seen people try and plant some live oaks out there on the barrier island to lesser or greater success, but very few trees growing on a barrier island in Texas. Uh, primarily, these are grass-covered wetlands. There we go. Okay. So how did the barrier islands form? Well, the theory is that uh, back in the Pleistocene, so thousands of years ago, let's say 10,000 years ago, the shoreline was much further offshore. Here's the present day shoreline. Well, 10,000 years ago, the shoreline was way out here. 
And these rivers, the Guadalupe, the Colorado, the Brazos, the Trinity, these rivers gouge these valleys into the land. And then about 5,000 years ago, the earth started warming up, snowpacks uh, melted, and sea level rose to present day sea levels. And these river valleys here flooded. And that's what these areas are, are flooded river valleys. Once the river rose, it flooded those river valleys. Then your barrier island system was built, and we talked about that, where one little uh, sandbar started it off. And sand naturally washes up on the Texas coast and along the Texas coast on these longshore currents. Everybody ever stood out there in the ocean and the, you turn around and all of a sudden your truck is way down there. You know, it's pushed you halfway down the beach. So that's our longshore current. And so it moves sand all along this shoreline. Sand will wash up on the beach. Wet sand will just sit there and do nothing. Dry sand will blow back and forth. Dry sand doesn't have the weight of the water on it. And so it'll blow around and it'll blow up to that little piece of grass. And that little piece of grass sticking up will actually cause act as a windbreak. And it will slow the wind down to where that little sand grain doesn't have the energy to blow away anymore. And so it will start kind of piling up around that little grass seedling. And then that seedling will grow up a little bit higher and a little wider, and it'll act as a bigger sand for a bigger windbreak and actually start slowing down the sand grains so that they don't blow away. Anybody go out to the uh, <laughs> dune planting? A couple of weeks ago that they had out at Kelly Hamby and they had it at on Folos Island. Nathan did. Uh, so that's what they're doing. They are planting grasses to basically slow down. That's what all sand fencing is. That's what the Christmas trees that we put out there on the beach every January. That's what planting grasses out on the beach does is it slows down the wind. Without the wind, that little sand grain is going to blow up over the dunes all the way over and then back into the bay and eventually just fill in the bay, quite literally. Uh, but all that vegetation at the top of the dunes is going to slow down that sand grain and keep it, hopefully, on the front of those dunes. And those dunes will actually grow forward. Anybody go out there? And gosh, forgive me because I'm bad with names, but we had like three hurricanes in a row one year. And it just ate the dunes into almost nothing. Well, if you go out there now, they're almost back. And we're talking a short three, four years later, they're almost back to their pre-storm levels. So enough sand has washed up and piled up on the front side of those dunes that they look like a uh, normal set of dunes uh, that it, it, if you weren't if you weren't here when they were eaten away you'd have a hard time telling where the old dunes were and the new dunes are yeah is the main intent of trying to rebuild the dunes to save the houses, if there were no houses yes. there, would there be anyone out there rebuilding dunes? Well, yes, only because there's a highway there too, and so it's trying to fix. It's trying to save the infrastructure. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Anything environmental or saving some species? No, no. If it were left to nature, 
that island would move back and forth. It would disappear over time. It would come back and be very thick over a couple of hundred years. It would get a couple of hurricanes in a row that would wash it right out. The pass. Ooh. This pass would move. Let's say the current's going this way. What it would do would be take sand from over here, dump it on this shoreline. And so this shoreline would grow this way. And it's taking sand from this shoreline and moving it over here. So this pass would creep down this way. A great example of that is Port Aransas, the lighthouse. It's a mile from the cut because they built the lighthouse before they built the jetties. They built the lighthouse and then the cut just moved. And so it's now a mile from the Corpus Christi Ship Channel. It's a useless lighthouse. It's pretty. It's a fun thing to kayak to, <clears throat> but it doesn't act as a lighthouse anymore. Uh, so left alone, these barrier islands move. They're very, very dynamic. Left alone, Surfside would have washed away and been built back already. Um, the evidence of that is the seawall that they've built. Same with Galveston. Galveston built a 13-foot, is it 13-foot? 13 13-foot 13 seawall uh, to keep the ocean from moving land that people had the audacity to build a house on. So if you build a house somewhere, you want that land to stay there. And so we are fighting nature the entire time. Everybody heard about the Mississippi River down by New Orleans? Left to it, they say left to its own devices, the Mississippi River would have now changed course and not flow through New Orleans. Well, you can't have that. We had too many people buy waterfront property along New Orleans. So they're spending millions and millions of dollars on levees and uh, uh, water breaks cement walls basically <clears throat> to keep the Mississippi River flowing in its channel. Same with barrier islands. That's what all jetties are for is to keep those passes open and stationary. That's what uh, that's why we're building dunes so that when storms and that's one of the things dunes do a very good job of is protecting everything behind them from storms. So I think we can go over that here in a minute. But if you have a storm out here in the Gulf of Mexico, we're not too worried about this. This is just sand. It can wash away and come back. It's not as big a deal. But back here behind the dunes, if you think about it on Surfside, that's where the houses are. That's where the highway is up here on this barrier flat or this high marsh. So that's what, yes, that's very much what we're trying to protect are the houses and, and the highway. Mike? Yes? The, the estuaries are actually the nurseries for a lot of the commercial fish and crustaceans. So don't we also have a vested interest in keeping the dunes to keep our estuaries open and not well, by the sea. that is, that's more, yes, um, I would say, but that's a natural process that will regulate itself. You may have, uh, such as, was it 2000, when was the big, big, big drought? Oh, Said it was the worst in 50 years, 2013? Every year. <laughs> 11? 11. 2011? Well, no water came down. I was working for LCRA at the time, the Lower Colorado River Authority. Everybody hates the River Authority during a drought. So I was working for the River Authority, and no water was coming down the Colorado River, or very little. Now, what's that? No, no, I was teaching kids how to kayak. Uh, so... The, but very little water was coming down the Colorado River. Now, a certain amount was because it had to by law, but it was 
part of what they were trying to do was send just a trickle enough down to keep the remnant of the oyster population alive. Because oysters don't like salty water. You don't see too many oysters growing in the Gulf of Mexico. You see them growing back here in the bay, and you see them growing more further back in the bay. Uh, Chocolate Bay, Chocolate Bayou, as opposed to the passes. And so uh, that's one of those things, those storms that open up or close a section of beach. Uh, if it washes through, generally what you'll have is a population of those nursery fishes will move to a different part of the bay. Uh, during the drought, they moved to the mouth of the rivers because that was the only place where the fresh water was. Um, Excuse me. So I don't know that protecting the dunes has a tremendous amount to do with the nurseries, um, mainly out of self-interest. More people are interested in their homes than they are nature, unfortunately. Uh, but the, uh, the storms coming through would, again, just be kind of a natural event. And the animals have kind of adapted to where, well, there's a cut in the pass here, and I don't like this much salt water, so I'll just move over here where it's fresher. So they'll they'll just adapt to storms, uh, just like a lot of animals during a you know a hurricane will go underground and just ride it out or fly off somewhere and ride it out. They do pretty good about self self regulating. Uh, the you know the problem comes when we dam up the rivers like we've done and then uh don't allow any water flowing down into the rivers or into the bays uh turning the drought even the, into a worse situation uh to the fact that a couple of river authorities and i'm not going to say who they were but got sued into having to send water down by law into the bays to keep, uh, they actually sued a river authority, not mine, but they sued a river authority. What's that? No. Uh, well, it was Guadalupe, Guadalupe River Authority, because they said they didn't send enough water down. That caused the blue crabs to die, to not, not to die, but to not reproduce as prolifically as they could have which is a staple diet of pooping cranes when they come down here. Oh, that's crane nice. is a federally protected endangered species. And so that's how they got sued. They said, your policies are hurting pooping cranes. And their policies were probably protecting their recreational activities, the hill country. Well, and whoever they're selling water to, yeah. Yeah, any water that a river authority lets flow into the bay, they don't make money on, you know, they divert it and sell it to rice farmers and uh, yeah, the hill country for drinking water. Uh, you know, that's how they, you know, that's how they make money. That's how they make their living. So it turns out that the government had to actually step in and said, no, you will let this much water flow into the bays uh, to keep oysters alive, blue crabs alive, because let's, major base we'll get to it but yeah if we start talking about ex estuaries uh i get in types of estuaries well we'll get into it but the uh yeah. the uh bays the estuaries are the nursery for most of the commercially fished animals on the Texas coast, shrimp, crabs, uh, redfish, trout, drum, uh, sharks. Most of a lot of your sharks are uh, use the estuary as a nursery. Those little bitty baby fish, when they're first born, if you threw them out in the ocean, the salt water would burn up their gills. Uh, they're just, they're too sensitive. So they got to start off life in the freshest, fresher, 
water of the bays, the brackish water, someone said it earlier, the brackish water of the bays. And so, yes, these uh, bays are vital to the commercial fishing industry. Again, it, it, there's, it's such a trickle-down effect because we talked about uh, the bays and the estuaries, a healthy estuary will produce a lot of blue crab and a lot of blue crab make it easy for hooping cranes to survive. And again, hooping cranes are federally protected, so you have to do that. So it's a, it's a long chain of events. Uh, I think this is just, yeah, how they were built. Uh, and I kind of glossed over that. Has anybody got a decent idea of how a barrier island was built? Those flooded valleys, those flooded river valleys, those became Galveston Bay. Uh, Nueces or Corpus Christi Bay. Uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Yeah, yeah Caracal Bay. The, all those flooded river valleys became our major bays. And the islands, the barrier islands that formed on front of it. Yeah, see, I've got these backwards. Those flooded river valleys became the Laguna Madre from the Rio Grande, Corpus Christi Bay from the Nueces River, Aransas Bay, San Antonio Bay, Matagorda Bay from the Colorado River, Galveston Bay, the Trinity River. Uh, all of those big rivers, when they flooded, and this barrier island formed in front of them just from a, a sandbar sticking its head above water it created those bays to go back the barrier island is broken up into uh several different islands along the texas coast you have the brazos island down on the very tip of texas padre island now because of the manfield mansfield cut somewhere right in here um, you have South Padre Island and North Padre Island. You have Mustang Island that has Hackery uh, Channel and Cedar Bayou separating it. You have San Jose Island. San Jose Island and Matagorda Island are unique in Texas in that there's no roads to them. To get to San Jose Island or Matagorda Island, you have to take a boat or a plane or a helicopter. Uh, there are landing strips on both. Uh, you have the Matagorda Peninsula sticking out here. Then you have Follett's Island and Galveston Island. And then the Bolivar Peninsula, which actually now, because of the, what's it called, rollover cut, Bolivar is now technically an island as well. Is there a bay missing that was like near Surfside? Because there's rivers that come in there, from Bernard and Bradley. Uh, every time that there's a river, major river that comes down in there, you have a bay. Oh, the Brazos? Yeah, it looks like there's, is there a reason there's a bay missing the, that's got Surfside? The Brazos River flows directly into the Gulf of Mexico. Right. So, I mean, that, it seems like all the rest of the major rivers have bay. Yes, they do. Why it, why it didn't develop like that, I don't know. If Go on Google and look at uh, the overhead, obviously, the Google Maps, look at the overhead shot of the Brazos River. You will see the old delta. Okay. So there used to be a delta, just like the Mississippi River Delta. That was dried up. Again, we talked about those millions of dollars of drying the Everglades. So now we're spending billions of dollars to reflood them. Well, they, they dried up the Brazos River Delta. Uh, but what's that? No, I, th I think it has to do with rice farming. Yeah. Yeah, you can't, you can't grow crops on a wetland. Uh, even, as funny as it seems, even a rice farm, which is a wetland, you need 
Well, you, you can control the water level. I don't know. We're asking some deep questions. You y'all are, uh, which is good. It's these are these are back. questions that I go home and ask myself and Google. Maybe. No, it's a great question. Yeah. It should be a man. You would think right here. Yeah, there should be a bay right there, but that's where the that's the Brazos River. And it just flows down. They kind of showed a little delta right there, which doesn't really truly exist anymore. And of course now the mouth of the Brazos River, like I said, it's been diverted. Uh now it shoots out what five miles west of where it originally did. Uh, but yeah, if you look at the whole rest of the Texas coast, there's a barrier island. And then one little gap right there where there's no barrier island and no bay. Uh, Where's Copano Bay on that? Copano Bay? Let me think. It should be right there. Right up in here. It's one of the secondary or tertiary bays. Oh, Copano. No, I'm sorry. Copano's right here. That's Rockport. That's the Arrangus National Wild. That's Karakawa Bay. That's Copano Bay right there. There's Redfish Bay, Corpus Christi Bay. I forgot the bay down, but Baffin Bay. Sorry. Oh, what am I talking about? I'm, I've got them right here. Uh, oh, they don't, even, they don't even have Baffin Bay. Is that the main one? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, is it silting in? Oh, they're actually filling it in. Okay. Wow, I thought they dredged it out last time. Uh, so all Texas bays are estuaries. An estuary is simply where salt water meets fresh water. So it's where a river flows into the ocean. And there's lots of different types of estuaries, as you're going to see. It can be as simple as the Brazos River a river flowing into the ocean where the salt water mixes and it, you know, the tide will go in and the tide will go out. Fresh water, heavy rains will push fresh water out into the Gulf of Mexico and push salt water out of the river. So that estuary is moving back and forth according to tide and according to rain events. It could be the Texas bays, uh, anywhere fresh water and salt water meet. I don't think I have anything. Oh, these are, yeah, three, three definitions. Well, four, if you include the last one. Uh, partially enclosed coastal body of brackish water with one or more rivers or streams flowing into it and with the free connection to the op open sea. So it's brackish water half fresh, half salt, or some combination thereof, uh, with one or more rivers flowing into it and a free connection to the open sea. So you gotta have ocean water coming in and fresh water coming in. Another definition is a semi-enclosed coastal body of water which has a free connection with the open sea and within which seawater is measurably diluted with fresh water derived from land drainage. Basically says the same thing. Uh, third one I found was a semi-enclosed body of water connected to the sea as far as the tidal limit or the salt intrusion limit and receiving freshwater runoff. However, the freshwater inflow may not be perennial. The connection to the sea may be closed for part of the year and tidal in influence may be negligible. So it's saying all those things in the above one, but maybe not for the whole year. Uh, you can have drought, you can have uh, cuts close off due to storms. So the last definition is the one I used. 
It's where fresh water and salt water mix. It's where a river meets the sea. That is an estuary. And an estuary is used as a nursery for a lot of animals. Uh, not only fish and crabs, uh, but also birds, uh, turtles, uh, all types of animals are using it as a estuary. Okay, so types of estuaries. Uh, uh, so types of estuaries, a coastal plain estuary formed uh, 10 to 18,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. Melting glaciers caused sea levels to rise and flooded low-lying river valleys, drowned river valleys. That's kind of what built our bays. They were, they were drowned river valleys. Uh, another great example of that is going to be Chesapeake Bay. Uh, was a big river valley, and then the sea levels rose and flooded that valley, and now you have the Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> the Trinity River flowing south of Houston carved out a big, basically a big uh, uh, hardwood bottomland that when the glaciers melted and the sea level rose, it flooded that bottomland and created Galveston Bay. Barbell estuaries are formed when sandbars or barrier islands are created by currents and waves depositing sediment from rivers. Estimated age of Texas barrier islands, approximately 5,000 years old. Uh, they have a restricted mouth of the river, uh, meaning it's not forming deltas. Uh, so the bar built are what we have here in Texas. Uh, the sandbars, which become barrier islands, trap the fresh water flowing in from the rivers behind them. Salt water comes in through the cuts. It mixes back and forth, and that creates your estuary. Uh, deltas are formed by sediment being deposited on the mouth of a large river over time. A network of channels form and can cause the river to change course. Tectonic estuaries are formed when land subsides, usually during an earthquake, forming a depression. Uh, Seawater and river water fill the basin, forming an estuary. Uh, and fjords are formed by glaciers, which carve long, deep, narrow valleys. Low circulation leading to anoxic water near the bottom. Uh, obviously, you're not having a lot of fresh water flow in off of a glacier. It's ice. They move slow. But you do get some fresh water mixing on the bottom of your glacier. So these are the basically the types we just talked about. There's the Chesapeake. Uh, oh, that hurt. Uh, there's the Chesapeake Bay uh, with these flooded river valleys. And so these were dry river valleys five to 10,000 years ago when the snow, uh, when the glaciers melted, sea level rose and flooded these low lying areas and created these bays. And again, you have rivers flowing in, it's open to the ocean water. So you have an estuary, fresh water and salt water mixing all in here. Bar built, uh, you've got your barrier island with your rivers flowing in and mixing here in uh, Matagorda Bay in this instance. I've got a question about that. The, the sediment that comes down those rivers is not what builds the barrier island? No. The barrier island is built offshore. Yeah, by offshore sand washing up on it. 
Now, on the back side, if you've ever wade fished back there, you know there's sticky, silty mud back there. So the, the silt that comes down, this is the Colorado River. The silt that comes out the Colorado River does coat the back of this barrier island. So you're going to find that silt on the back of that barrier island. But what built the island was sand from the ocean. What actually physically is making it grow and causing it to pop up in the first place is sand from the ocean. What happens to all the sediment in the river? Uh, it flows into the Gulf. It create, it's creating this delta right here. A lot of it is uh, flushed right out the passes. It, it will, yeah. So like right here, the Colorado River used to flow directly into the Gulf of Mexico as well as the Brazos. The Colorado River was diverted. And it's creating this delta. So it's falling out now right into here. So it's kind of funny. The two biggest rivers in the state of Texas, two of the two of the biggest rivers, well, no, never mind. Two of the biggest rivers in the state of Texas did not form a barrier island. They flowed directly into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I don't know why. But the two big, the Brazos and the Colorado flowed from the Panhandle all the way down and then flew directly into the Gulf of Mexico. So those big ones did not uh, dump into a bay and silt out. It's doing it now. It has since, gosh, and I forget, I want to say the 30s is when they diverted it. Uh, but the lower Colorado River Authority had diverted the river, and now it's creating this little delta. Why did they do that? Uh, I don't remember. I'm sure it had something to do with flooding, but I can't remember off the top of my head. I should know. I worked for them for five years. Uh, and I worked for them right there, so I would I should know. But uh, but they did divert it into the bay. Uh, and that's that little area, the, the Colorado River, that's the little area I was talking about where the oyster and shrimp industry survived that drought. It was right around there where that little trickle of water was coming down the Colorado River. Uh, there were very few shrimp and oysters and blue crabs and there was very little anything in the texas bays they were all kind of situated right around here right around where the colorado river comes down and flows out uh, do you think the brazos was the like highest velocity river of the river of the two I don't know which one is a higher velocity. Probably the Brazos, because it's coming from a higher elevation up on the up on the plains. But I don't know. I haven't looked at a gauge to see. That's a good question too. Y'all are stumping the trunk here. Sorry. Uh, so a delta. Everybody's familiar with a delta, uh, where the water flows down. <laughs> It flows steep, and then when it gets to the coast, it flattens out. Once it flattens out, it starts to uh, spread out and will form little rivulets all the way out. Its sediment will fall out, and it will form those little islands that you see, uh, those little deltas as the sediment and the water, I'm sorry, as the water continues on its way to the Gulf of Mexico, in the case of our famous Delta, which is New Orleans uh, or Louisiana. And uh, one of the things you might get to do, if you're lucky, 
is work with John O'Connell here. He has what they call a stream trailer. And it's a trailer filled with little plastic pebbles. And you start a river up here and it flows down and it flows down a steep area. Then it gets to where it flattens out. And that flat area actually forms a delta. And you can kind of show people how a river is created, how a river is formed. It's a pretty cool little uh, program that if you get to work on it, he does a lot of water fairs and Captain Shish Kebab and a lot of uh, volunteer opportunities to play with the uh, stream trailer. And you get to see how a delta forms out. But this, whoop, this whole area from where the water comes in from the main river until it hits the Gulf of America, the, the uh, ocean, this whole area is an estuary, brackish water, half salt, half fresh. Tectonic, uh, one of the more famous examples of that would be San Francisco Bay. Seismic activity called the land caused the land to fall. And uh, so right along the San Andreas Fault caused the land to fall and uh, San Francisco Bay was created due to that falling land. The water came in from the Golden Gate Pass and uh, flooded that area. So again, you've got uh, rainwater and river water flowing into the San Francisco Bay. Ocean water comes in through Golden Gate Pass, and you have an estuary. And then finally, a fjord. Uh, and again, fjords are caused by glaciers. Don't have any fjords. <laughs> well, not in Texas, for sure. I don't know if Alaska has a fjord or not. Do they? Okay. Uh, but again, caused by glaciers coming down. Uh, steep valleys, they carve those valleys out, and that ice is fresh water, and it mixes with the ocean. Uh, here's a, a fjord connected out here to the open ocean, and so it is actually an estuary. And so a lot of different types of estuaries, from our little bar-built barrier island estuary to all the way up to fjords. Okay, so on our uh, field trip, got the word, on our field trip on Saturday, we are going to go on a little exploration, <clears throat> and we are going to explore from the bay to the gulf. So we are going to go along this. We are going to look at the bay or lagoon. We're going to look at the marsh. We're going to look at the high marsh or the barrier flat. We're going to look at the dune ridge. We're going to look at the beach. And then all the way out to the open ocean, we're going to explore that. When we're out there, some things we're going to be looking for in the bay. So again, the bay which is our nursery to oysters, redfish, shrimp, blue crab, flounder, um, what is that? black drum, ducks, mud minnows, uh, all of that stuff is living out there in the bay. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to catch some of it. We'll be pulling the same net out there, and it's a lot of fun. Those little mud minnows and blue crabs and shrimp uh, are fairly easy to catch. Uh, of course, an oyster is pretty slow. They're easy to catch if you can find them. Uh, the other things, black drum, redfish, sometimes you can catch some little fingerlings of them out there if it's the right time of year. Um, and then, of course, the birds, the ducks, the herons, the egrets uh, out in the bay, or, well, I shouldn't say herons and egrets. Uh, 
Uh, herrings and egrets, egrets generally aren't out in the bay. They're in the marsh. Uh, but ducks are out in the bay. Can you think of another bird that's out in the bay? Big one? Pelicans. Pelicans, yeah. Pelicans swim around out there. Uh, seagulls will swim around out there. Uh, terns will feed out there, diving. Anybody ever seen terns? Just nose diving into the water. Uh, so out there on the bay, quite a few different types of uh, bird species that we can see. In the bay, there's also seagrasses. Seagrasses tend to grow in saltier water. So we don't have a ton of seagrasses up here. We have, in Texas, the most seagrasses are down in the Laguna Madre. The Laguna Madre is a unique bay system in that it doesn't have, from the Nueces River, So the Laguna Madre, this bay right here, from the Rio Grande to the Nueces, doesn't really have a river flowing into it. So it's open to the ocean here. It's open to the ocean there. It's got fresh water coming in here, fresh water coming in here. The rest of it is kind of closed off. So what happens is salt comes in, mixes, the water evaporates and the salt stays in the bay. So what you get is what we call a hyper saline bay system. So the Laguna Madre is actually saltier than the Gulf of Mexico as a general rule. Heavy, heavy rain events can mix, you know, storms can mix that up. But that being said, down there in the Laguna Madre, there's tons of seagrasses. Uh, you can see prop scars from where boats drive through it. Uh, and of course, they're trying to protect it. Up here, we don't have quite as much seagrass. We do have some. We do have manatee grass that'll grow up here. And it's widgeon grass. Um, but nowhere near as much as they have down south. Uh, well, I'll talk about that later. So the low marsh, what do I mean by the low marsh? The low marsh oh, I'm missing a marsh. Uh, so the low marsh is where the tidal affected marsh. So the tides flood it and unflood it daily, basically, if not monthly, as the tides go up and down. It starts off with the smooth cord grass. <clears throat> smooth cord grass grows in the water. So it is actually out of the water very little. When we have a super, super low tide, uh, some of this smooth cord grass can be high and dry, but usually it's growing in the water. You have things like, uh, this is black mangrove. This is, oh, salt, not salt grass, glass wart, sorry. Uh, this is glass wart and this stuff grows, again, it can get covered by, it can get covered by the tide. Technically, it could twice a day as the tide goes in and out twice, sometimes here on the Texas coast. Uh, the black mangrove has actually kind of adapted. It's growing in such anaerobic soils that its roots have to grow up and stick up out of the ground so it can breathe uh, because it's in such uh, anaerobic soil from the water being over it. Uh, the glasswort grows a little higher up, so it's not covered quite as much. We're going to look at that during our field trip. 
neat thing about the glass wart, I mean, the uh, black mangrove, it needs a very calm shoreline for it to grow. So if you have a very dynamic shoreline, i.e. lots of waves washing up on it, you're not going to get mangrove or black mangroves. Also, it can't take a freeze. So we have very little of it up here around the Houston area or the Galveston area uh, because, number one, we have a pretty dynamic shoreline. We have big bays. And so have a lot of wave action on the shore. And that kills a lot of the black mangrove, as well as every couple of years we get a freeze. And that can uh, kill them down as well. So more seagrasses and more mangroves down south in the Laguna Madre. Luckily for us, more, oyst more oysters up here because oysters like fresh water. So uh, we, we get the oysters, they get the seagrass. Take oysters. Yes. I, I will take oysters over grass any day. Uh, Whoops, some of the birds that you might see, herons and egrets, ibises, poking around spoonbills. If anybody comes out to the park, uh, we have a little pond out there that about, oh gosh, 40 spoonbills are roosting in now. Uh, so when they come back from their morning feed, they sit in these trees right around this little pond. Uh, it's been a great little tourist attraction here for the past couple of weeks while they've been roosting up in there. Uh, let's see. Oh, also in the uh, low marsh, you've got your fiddler crabs. Uh, you'll see these. They have their little holes with a little dirt pile set right next to it. Hundreds and thousands of these little fiddler crabs. When we go out to the bay on Saturday, I never see them. That's the one thing we never see when we go out there. Keep our fingers crossed, we might see some crab holes when we go out there. But for whatever reason, this area is pretty deficient in crab holes. Are those the little guys that live like on Surfside? What's that? Are those the little guys you'll find on Surfside Beach? That Not on the beach. They'll live uh, back on the bay side. So, yeah, the, they live, again, in the low marsh. So they're back by the bay. We'll get onto the beach here in a second. So the high marsh, this is well where the variety of your vegetation is. And we've got um, Christmas berries, saltwort, sea oxide daisies, marsh hay cordgrass. Marsh hay cordgrass is a signature species. Signature species. That's not what I'm trying to say. What am I trying to say? Keystone species of the uh, high marsh where you see that, you'll know you're not in the low marsh anymore. We'll watch it go from the smooth core grass is the, the lowest marsh. That's the, the, you're basically in the water. And then the intertidal, you'll get this Glass wart, as well as some, a little bit of black mangrove, but mainly uh, some salt wart uh, and a little purslane to your next vegetation field is going to be marsh hay cordgrass. And it's pretty, pretty dramatic how it jumps from one to the other. Uh, pocket gophers, all your mammals, white tailed deer. Uh, coyotes, possums, skunks, raccoons, bobcats, uh, all the mammals, shrews, mice, all the mammals that live out there on the barrier island, they're living in the high marsh. They're living, uh, obviously, where it doesn't flood as often. The high marsh will flood. Every every spot except the top of the dunes will flood on a barrier island. It just has to take a big enough storm. But during Harvey, uh, not Harvey, during Ike, 
every part of Follett's Island and Surfside was underwater. So a big enough storm will flood your barrier island. But the high marsh doesn't get flooded that often. How often does a force five hurricane come through every 10, 15 years? Uh, has a chance to rebuild itself in between. So the high marsh uh, is an area, that's where life is. That's where you build houses on a barrier island, is on the high marsh. Uh, that's where you put the highway is on the high marsh. So when we go out there on Saturday, we'll be looking at that and seeing uh, the areas where you put infrastructure. Trying to get through here. The dunes. So the dunes are kind of interesting. There's a front side and a back side to the dunes. The back side of the dunes basically has the vegetation of the high marsh. Uh, it's got that Smooth cord grass might have some uh, uh, woody vegetation, some real stout woody vegetation, like a couple of palm trees or, excuse me, uh, even though it's invasive, uh, salt cedar could be growing out there. The uh, front side of the dune is kind of the interesting part. That's where you get things like railroad vine, the sea purslane, uh, the goat's foot daisy, beach tea, the sea oats, those are all dune building plants. Those are the plants that slow down the wind. Those are the wind breaks out there. If you don't have those, what do you use? You use that sand fencing to try and slow down the wind to create your doom. All of those act as that windbreak. Some of it do a better job than the others. The sea oats, because of the root system that it uses to hold on to the sand once it attracts it, is particularly good at growing dunes. In fact, that's what usually when you hear people planting grasses out on the dunes, sea oats are one of the things they're planning out there. The back shore. What is the back shore? The back shore is from the dune to the uh, high tide, the highest tide mark. And it's, as you can see, not much lives there. So this is the little guy you see on the beach at Surfside. He is about the only thing that lives on the beach full time. A lot of things go out there. Uh, raccoons, white-tailed deer, you can see on the early morning on the beach. It's a beautiful sight. Uh, even humans will go out there, but we don't live there. Uh, it floods all the time on the four beach. But this little guy stays out there the whole time. More on him Saturday. But he's a fast, I actually do, uh, if you stay in Master Nationalist long enough, I think I've got another two years, but I do about an hour and a half talk on just ghost crabs. So I'm going to skip over him. But the back shore of the beach, not a lot lives there because it's it floods so much from the ocean, and yet it's high and dry. The foreshore, this is from the high tide mark to the low tide mark, you get, again, ghost crabs, ghost shrimp. You get those coquina clams. Anybody ever seen coquina clams out of the beach or bean clams, sometimes they're called, uh, that live out there in the millions on the Texas beaches, uh, as well as birds sitting on the foreshore, uh, picking in the sand or what have I got? Yeah, pecking in the sand or just kind of hanging out. So the foreshore is dry during low tide, but wet during high tide. During low tide, you see a lot of animals out there on that foreshore. The swash zone. The swash zone is where the waves are washing up and down on the beach. 
the swatch zone moves. So it starts out right here, the waves washing up on the beach. And then as the tide comes in, it moves up the beach. And then as the tide goes out, it moves down the beach. So the swatch zone moves. But it's where the waves are actually washing over the beach. What that wave action does is it actually turns the sand fluid turns it into a liquid, basically. Uh, and you can actually, everybody, has anybody stood in the ocean where the waves wash over your feet? You kind of start to sink. And that's because that sand is fluid. It's actually quicksand. Uh, it's, a, it's a fluid sand that you can sink in. It's not too fast. It's not dangerous. But it allows these animals like this... Uh, Mole crab up here in the top left. Why am I pointing? This mole crab uh, on the top left to swim down through that water. It allows these uh, polychaete worms, segmented worms, to swim down through the sand. Same with the coquina clams, those bee clams. They can actually swim down through that sand. They're not digging holes. This guy, the ghost shrimp, he digs a hole. And he'll actually, and, I'll, and we'll talk about him when we get out there. He actually secretes a little fluid that makes the hole stay. But these guys actually swim through that sand. And they can only do it in the swash zone because that's the only place that sand is fluid. So all these mole crabs, all these segmented worms, all these uh, coquina clams have to move up and down the beach as the tide comes in and out. So it's a, it's a pretty neat little trick, especially when you consider that half of these things don't have a brain. Uh, and yet they can still move up and down the beach uh, and figure out if the tide's going in or going out. The coquina clams are pretty cool to move up the beach. What they do is they're, they're underground. If they want to move up the beach, they wait till the wave comes out and then dig themselves up. And then when the wave comes in, it'll move them up the beach. And just the opposite if they want to go out, they'll wait till the water comes in and then they'll stick their head up and then let the outgoing wave take them back down the beach. Supposedly, they can tell by the vibrations in the sand. I have no idea how they tell whether the tide is going in or going out. Are the polychaete worms venomous? They have a sting to them, yes. Mm -hmm. I've, never, I've never been stung with one where I've felt it. It's kind of like, uh, oh, those moon jellies. They, they, they're stinging you, yes, but their nematocyst is so small, it's not getting through your skin. Okay. Um, like so, but yes, those segmented worms are venomous. Yeah, venomous, not poisonous. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't eaten one. They may be poisonous too. Let's find out for science. You. Worms? Yeah. Um, well, if you dig for them quite a bit, if you dig for them and, uh, you know, or hunt for them, you can find them quite easy. On the beach, almost never. They're underground. Yeah. Um, I've so, done like a decade of volunteer stuff on the beach, not digging, um, and I've seen one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Generally, if you're not looking for them, you're not going to find them. Uh, but we have a screen and a shovel that we dump a lot of sand into and sift all the sand out of it. And you can get those coquina clams. It's a little early. We're probably not going to see coquina clams. It's a little early in the season. Coquina clams, I'll show you how to do it. And then the next time you're at the beach, you can do it. But they're better in the summertime, late summer when it's super hot outside. That's when you catch coquina clams. And then, of course, the other thing you see in the swatch zone is everything that eats those items. So 
Willets, uh, rather ugly picture of a winter drab Willet, but then also Sanderlings. The Sanderling is the little one that runs back and forth with the waves, doesn't want to get its feet wet. When the wave goes out, he runs out there, peck, 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 peck. When the wind the wave comes back in, he runs back up the beach, keeps his feet dry. The uh, sandling, and that's what they're after. They'll after those coquinas, they'll after those little worms, or after those mole crabs, uh, and just make a feast on it. In fact, those little coquinas, <coughs> you can find. Everybody know what an owl pellet is? Owls will eat uh, mice and voles and shrews and things like that, and digest all the soft parts, but the bones and the fur, they form into a little ball and then they'll <clears throat> cough it up. And that's an owl pellet. You can find them in barns and you can find them under big trees and stuff like that. Well, there's a bird, a lot of birds do it, but specifically the willet will eat those coquina clams and they'll bite them and crack them open and just eat the whole thing, shell and all. And they'll digest the little clam part inside but the shells, they'll kind of compress it to a little ball and then <clears throat> cough it up. And there's a little pile of shells on the beach. And if you ever see that, we call that a willet pellet. Uh, yeah, just it, well, it it literally looks like a bird threw up a bunch of shells. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just a little stack of shells from where the bird was eating those coquina clams. And just, I guess, got full and <laughs> and got rid of. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, now we're into the Gulf of Mexico. And so we're going to explore the Gulf of Mexico when we get out there with a good net pull, <clears throat> hopefully. Uh, and some things, of course, we can find out there. Pompano, mullet, uh, menhaden, shad, uh, blue crabs. Blue crabs go from the bay to the Gulf of Mexico. They're born in the bay. They use the bay as their nursery. The little ones are back there in the bay. Uh, the big ones are out in the salt water uh, living. And of course, uh, sea turtles and dolphins, probably not gonna catch either one of those in our nets. Uh, wrong time of year for it to begin with. Wrong thing to do. Wrong thing to do, secondly. Uh, but, those are some animals that you can find out in the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, their, their range is, is fairly unlimited in the Gulf. The uh, flock can uh, swim all around. But hopefully, we can find some of those in our uh, field trip and catch them and look at them and kind of talk about them and how they've adapted to live out there. I actually do a program that I call a beach safari, which is the second half of this. I go from the, well, actually I start in the Gulf and I go from the Gulf to the Swashone, to the fort, to the foreshore, to the back shore, to the dune. <clears throat> Looking at different animals that live there and how they've adapted. And that's what we're gonna talk about a lot. Saturday, I keep wanting to say tomorrow, Saturday on how these animals and plants have adapted to live in that environment. Uh, and how they have, again, adapted to the soils, adapted to the salt, adapted to the environment that they're living in to live there. That's that ghost crab that lives on the beach by itself. Uh, again, I talk for an hour and a half on the ghost crab, and all I talk about is how it's adapted to live on that little beach. So it's a fascinating little uh, animal. So... That is my program for the night. I got through, eh, well, not early. Uh, I think that was awesome. But, uh, so, field trip is going to be at the boat ramp, and I believe you've got a nice map. Uh, yes, everybody should have an email with the map, and um, if you want a copy, we have a copy over here. I'd like us to meet at the Jetty Park on Surfside and meet there at nine o'clock, if that's okay with you, Mike. 
The yeah. reason I'm thinking is if we take all of our cars out, yeah. we're not going to be able to. It'll be like it was last time. Yeah. It'll be no. worse. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike is to meet at the Jetty Park. We can leave some cars there. And if people are willing, let's try to carpool. And so it gives you time to clean out your car a little bit. <laughs> get all the textbooks out of it. And I will say this. So, yes, the water temperature is a little chilly, although there were a bunch of spring breakers in it uh, this past week. But this field trip is a lot more fun if you wear shorts and some shoes you can get wet. I'm not asking you to get weight steep out here in this water, but ankle deep. I've got some hand nets that we can use. We can that swash zone is really the most prolific uh, uh, place to find life. And so if you can get out there and get your shoes wet, you can just bring some water shoes uh, or some sports sandals, uh, something you can kind of walk around in the water or if you're brave enough to go barefoot. Uh, but it's a lot more fun if you actually get out there and start hunting these animals with us. Uh, I'm going to be out there with Nathan. We'll be pulling the nets and looking for stuff, but everybody will have a chance to uh, pull a net if they want or use the hand nets that we use, use the screen that we use. We use a, a thing called a slurp gun or a, a sand siphon or a sand pump to get some of these things out of the Swash zone. So, uh, like I said, it's just it's a lot more fun if you're willing to get your feet a little wet. Before I end, that's my last slide. Anybody have any questions about barrier islands or estuaries? All right. Well, thank you all very much. Sorry I went a little over there. I was hoping to get out about. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Let me get you your. Oh yeah. Um, that was kicked around. I'd like to talk about projects for a few minutes, and then I'll let you go. I'm just wondering about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you. I look forward to the activity. Yes. I, I have so many questions. Oh, no. I don't know. Do 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 Okay, guys.
Try to do a few things real quick. It gets now three. Uh -huh. Something to do together. Amanda, do you need any other uh, iNaturalist handles for the people in here? I think I've got everybody that's in the room. Oh, wonderful. I know. What? So. Yeah. Okay. Everybody give us the t shirt sizes. I haven't filled that out yet. I just want to say. You're on the things. <laughs> Or they, I think, t-shirt. It's a t-shirt just like this like a regular that Amanda's wear. Yeah, they fit real <laughs> true to the sizes. This is a 2X. Yeah, I wear a 2X. Go size up. And did, if, do we have spares upstairs that if, if someone, someone wants to do like a fit test? Up. Yeah, if you don't sure. grab my key. Okay. You're in charge of this. Nobody's talking at the moment. Sure. Oh, okay. yeah. no. I didn't have any problem with shrinkage. Yes. In that? It's my no. name. No. It's, it's, it's a little one. Well. I mean, my last name is Lawrence and Johnson. Should I pick? Should I give the glory to myself or my husband? Yourself. All the glory. <laughs> Make it L dash J. I was a teacher. That's what my students called me, Mrs. L J. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's too long. I'll take it. Long. Well, I think they can adjust it, but they've also come up with some weird names. Uh, Emily Matula from last year that's finishing up here. Um, they made her Emily Matthias. Oh. Well, and we don't know where the Matthias came from. Okay, guys. I gave you a, whoo! Thank you. I gave you some intern class projects that we can work on. Uh, is anybody interested in doing leaf litter? But if nobody else wants to do it, I'll do that. I'll do that. Okay. This will be a fairly quick project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really should be. It should be like an afternoon type project where we can get together. I've got the equipment and all. And I'm thinking about us doing about a foot to two foot square area of leaf litter. You know, I don't want us to get it real big because you're going to be overwhelmed with too many leaves and too much dirt and all that. I think it'll get unruly. If we do it very small, we can use a flat shovel and get everything up fairly quickly. It can be put into a trash bag and then brought to where we have the tub and the screen. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, that's what I was gonna ask you all. Uh, I don't have any problem if we do, do it up in the Northern part of the county and down in the Southern part to make it easier where people don't have to drive so much. Yeah, one okay. Well, I'm a little more interested in three, but I can do either one. Okay. Really, if we want to do something together to make it easier for people, I would be okay with either one. Okay. Well, the purpose of the project is one, to do something that helps the chapter, uh -huh. and two, to do something that kind of helps us work together on something. Right. You get to know one another a little bit easier when you're not in a classroom setting where everybody's kind of sitting separately. Uh, the second one is a fairly simple project in that uh, the bird wingspan, we have a big banner. it's not really, yeah, a banner would be the best word for it. And you stand up and you they measure the distance between your fingers. And 
depending on that, they match you with a bird that has a wingspan like that. So there's a lot of sandhill cranes, <laughs> you know, when you get the adults. With the kids, you get a big variety of different creatures because, um, you know, the growth is so much different on the kids. Uh, what Ruby would like to have is a big poster that shows the different birds so that when somebody says, well, what is a roseate spoonbill? They can point and see it's the pink bird that everybody thought was a flamingo at one time. <laughs> uh, you know, what's a sandhill crane? What's a whooping crane? What's a, I don't know. I think that's a good idea, but I also think my mom has that poster. <laughs> really? Oh, okay. These are these are uh, really uh, supposed to be birds that come through our area. So, yeah, there there are some posters that have been done like that. Uh, Amanda had worked at one time and tried to pull the different birds off the internet, but I think that file got lost. But the cost of making a poster, of framing it, uh, the Friends of the Brasoria National Wildlife Refuges will cover the cost. So we're not in a situation where, you know, you have to put any money out on it. The third project was one that was suggested during the critter hunt, and it may or may not be of any interest to you, but it would be to choose a site and do a cleanup. Now that one would be something that the cleanup itself is not such a big, uh, uh, it's not of as great of interest to the chapter, but what they wanna know is what did you clean up? You know, did you have refrigerators? Did you have baby diapers? Did you have straws. There's an app called Clean Swell that's used to categorize the different kinds of trash you can get. And by doing that, they can, it gives them better information on what's coming in in different areas or what is being uh, dropped along different waterways because Everything eventually makes its way into the Gulf. You know, if you throw out cans, if you throw out your food wrappers, whatever, eventually it's going to wash into the storm sewers or it's going to wash into a ditch that washes into a creek that washes into a bigger creek and into the river and into the Gulf. Are there vacations I think? No, no. Some people, I can't remember exactly who had mentioned doing a cleanup at the boat launch where we did our critter hunt because it was you. It was me. <laughs> well, for once I listened to myself. Yeah. Oh, very much trash. Yeah. Yeah, there was too much trash. And that's even with a person from the county that's assigned to come clean up the boat ramp area. And yeah, it gets weekly love and it's just a difficult battle with all the uh, abandonment of trash people that want to take to the landfill. And I doubt that they're going along every one of the trails and such and looking for stuff. I, I would think it would be more clean up the main area. If they can get rid of that when people dump things, as Amanda was saying, that's accomplishing quite a bit. So uh, it can be the side of a road where people are throwing their trash out, that ends up washing in. You can use that also toward uh, water specialist certification which is something you'll probably be interested in doing once you graduate. 
that something that can be done Saturday during the field group? No, there's more uh, required than there would be time allotted. And it couldn't be done as a double billing thing where you could log it as intern time or as um, advanced training for water specialist, but not both. So you have to pick. Oh, sorry, we I thought you meant do, the other thing. We could do a clean up at the canoe launch and all the way down to where we go on the beach. We can catalog that and that would be a wonderful project. I'd be willing to accept that. Okay. Um, Nate is gonna try and do a project on junior rangers with the park personnel. Um, I don't know that you open that to anyone else that has ideas. Yeah, I'm looking for ideas. We're gonna start a junior ranger, junior mascot program for kids. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a really neat thing. Okay. So just in case, should we all bring a trash bag with us this weekend? It's always a good idea to have a trash bag with you. In fact, I'm right now. You're not going to be there. Sorry. I thought you said you had. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Hey, uh, uh, is there anything at the county parks that we could do a project doing? Well, there's one. Number four is one of those. That would be to look at. Uh, Camp Mohawk has each of their pavilions, dorms, other buildings named after one of the indigenous people's tribes. And if you're interested, that would be something you can do more in a team or even an individual project if you have to. And it would be to do some research come up with a little flyer that tells a bit about the people that are represented there. Um, if you're doing Karankwa, I do not want to hear their cannibals, <laughs> that they have indecent relationships with dogs. Uh, those would not be acceptable. <laughs> they, they really are not like that. <laughs> I look and we're seven years. Right. Isn't that Boston went up against a bunch of cannibal crocodiles? Yeah. So the Spanish, when they came over, and they like it was literally like a propaganda thing. Like they wrote that they were hermaphrodites, that they were cannibals, that they were yes, dog that lovers, like dog. <laughs> Super dog not lovers. Christian. Not, well, <laughs> not Christians. Oh my God. Like, we believed all that even in the 90s, but it's like now that like learning and real, yeah, it's like not true. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's easy. Well, we do it too. You know, it, when we've been in, in various battles, uh, the Gulf War, whatever, like that, I, yeah. we demonize whoever it is that we're against. Propaganda like that helps get people really stirred up and yeah. go do something. It doesn't mean those people are bad. Some of them are, but, you know. Okay, so you have to change it yourself. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a bit of a I think it would so be I very would useful to the park. Thank you. If you want to try. And if you have yeah, other ideas yes. that you would prefer to do, but no, I'm open to suggestions, okay. but I figured I'd give you some things that we could do. 
But if yeah. you want to yeah. try it in the bathroom yeah. for fit to see, like, believe me, this is better than to, like, going out sleeves. and you tour an area and you tell us all the wonderful things you saw there. Here, and we've heard it 20 or 30 years in a I row, I, and it's, it's don't want to hear another presentation like that. And so the presentation, will be done during graduation? Uh, it may come after graduation. Uh, if you do the leaf litter, I think we should do a nature notes out of it. That's about a 15-minute presentation after AT. And I think it would be a, of great interest to the entire chapter because I think we're going to find things in the leaf litter we didn't know were even here. You might discover some new things altogether. And we will be wearing gloves when we do it because there are venomous creatures in there and some things we don't want to contact. There's just some pokey stuff in the litter. Um, I can say from experience that doing this with the pine needles will get uh, larval crane flies embedded in your hands. And it doesn't come out easily. We may have to end the meeting to do that. <laughs> okay. How many of you want to do trash? I think you can going to ask that. What if you can't decide? I need everybody to do one thing. But if you want to do more than one, hey, you know, exploring is part of being a master naturalist. So that's not a bad thing. So one or more things. Yeah. But you're only required to do one. And you only get up to 10 hours of credit towards your internship. Oh, neither one of those for doing 10 hours. I might do both. Let's yeah, see how to do it. hours. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can pick up trash and dump. But then you got to log it in on Cleanswell. So it's like how many cups, it's not how many hard. masks? Oh, no, it's not hard. Um, there's a whole system. We have a group of people that go every month to go clean up. And it's a fascinating what they find out there. Like, <laughs> yeah. If you want to try it while we're doing our beach, uh, our wetlands area, you know. Oh, how nice. Somebody threw out somebody's china and clothes and stuff at shadow creek ranch nature trail Draw. the day that we were arriving to do a tour of it and kathy pittman who's president of the chapter was there first she saw that and she was trying to get it loaded into her car to uh -huh. be able to go throw it away <laughs> and i thought Somewhere there's some poor guy or gal that just lost all their stuff. <laughs> so what happens if you don't say sorry? Yeah. 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 Ponds and lakes in neighborhoods? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Those are tension ponds. He brought it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Do you still have it? Someone had thrown away someone's stuff. Yeah. Like ashes were in yeah. there. Oh, it's Maybe they were trying to heave it and their hands are slippery. I mean, just like, just like in the where was your favorite place? This neighborhood retention pond. Please lay me to rest there. I'm going to guess that this person wasn't well liked. I don't know. Or I just like their retention. Yeah. If you don't like them, just donate them. If you don't like the person, just donate them. No fee involved. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mason. Okay.